I want to welcome you tonight to UT Health House Calls. This event sponsored by the Mercedes-Benz dealers of Greater Houston. We're proud to partner with UT Health to bring awareness to important health issues and the incredible work that's being done by the faculty, providers, researchers, the university, and UT Physicians Clinics. Mercedes-Benz and Star Motor Cars is dedicated to the health and safety of our community. And thanks to this partnership, I'm pleased to announce that Star Motor Cars once again has provided two $5,000 scholarships to UT Health, benefiting the School of Dentistry. Thank you. Tonight with us, we have some Mercedes-Benz UT Health scholars. They are the next generation of physicians, and we're glad they, they came here tonight so you could meet them. Raise your hands. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hey, once again, I really want to thank you for coming out. I know it was uh, not easy to get here tonight, but thank you so much. I think you're going to find that it's really worth your while. I'm going to turn it back over to Karen Kaplan, who's with UT Health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jinx, and thank you again to Mercedes-Benz Star Motor Cars for hosting tonight's very, very special event, and congratulations to our two students. UT Health House Calls is a wonderful way to bring awareness to important health topics. And thanks to abc13.com, an equally wonderful way to bring the answers to your health questions. But like I said, tonight is very special. Tonight is about giving you the tools to be prepared, should the moment arise, to possibly save a life. With us is Dr. Ben Babro, Professor and Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at McGovern Medical School and Chief of Emergency Medicine at Memorial Hermann Hospital. He is internationally known for his work in resuscitation science and a trailblazer in strategies for time-sensitive emergencies such as cardiac arrest, acute stroke, traumatic brain injury, and also for turning bystanders into lifesavers. Also with us tonight is Dr. Salil Bandari, Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at McGovern Medical School and also nationally recognized as a top educator in the art and science of resuscitative medicine. And finally, let me introduce their lovely assistant, Dr. Kevin Schultz, who wears two very large hats as a clinical assistant professor in emergency medicine at McGovern and as the assistant EMS physician director of the Houston Fire Department. The Q&A portion of our program will be moderated by me, so please everyone out in the ether, please send in your questions and we will get to as many of them as we possibly can this evening. And so without further ado, Please welcome Drs. Ben Babro and Salil Bandari and Dr. Kevin Schultz. All right, thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're really honored, really honored to be here with you. Um, this is, I have to say, this is a really special event. I'm so impressed with the folks that put this together. It's an amazing community service. Um, and I want to thank Mercedes-Benz, you know, and UT, and obviously ABC for coming together to do this. Um, I'm sure that this event will eventually lead to saving lives. Um, we're going to talk about a really serious topic tonight, it's the topic of cardiac arrest. We are going to add a little bit of levity to this topic. It's not out of disrespect, but we're tr we want to make this both interesting and memorable for you. And sometimes if you can uh, make levity to some things, it helps you remember stuff. So it's not out of disrespect if it seems like that. You know, this is a major public health problem, cardiac arrest. 60 people, six zero people, had a cardiac arrest today in Texas, just in the state of Texas. 60 people yesterday had a sudden cardiac arrest in Texas. And 60 people tomorrow will have a cardiac arrest in Texas. Every single day. It's about the same as a Greyhound bus carries about 60 people crashing every single day. 
And sadly, only a small minority of those people, roughly about five to six percent, actually survive and go back home. And unlike some other things in Texas, we're, we're actually below the national average. And what I've already learned is Texas doesn't like to be second in anything, let alone below, below the average. Um, I've already picked up on that. Um, you know, there's some important things that we can all do to dramatically improve cardiac arrest survival. And so our goal is to teach you those things tonight. And one of those things is a bystander, a lay rescuer, being able to recognize cardiac arrest and being able and willing to do a few key things and to do those right away. And we're going to teach you those things in just a moment. But what I can tell you is a bystander doing CPR can triple that person's chance of surviving, triple. And the doctors in the room know that we have very, very few things in medicine that can triple your chance of survival. But this is actually one of them. You know, we think, we think along the lines of a system, we call it a, a system of care or a, the chain of survival. So there's lots of things in that chain of survival. There's the first thing, which are the people at the scene. Then there's the 911 dispatch system, how that interaction goes. And then there's the, our EMS rescuers, how quickly they respond, the, the, the rapidity and the quality of their care. And then there's what happens once you get to the hospital. And so we actually focus on all of those things. You know, it's not enough for us as emergency physicians to just have all of our tools and techniques and medications and therapies in the hospital and wait for people to show up. We actually used to have that strategy. And what we found is that with many things, like cardiac arrest, if that's our strategy, by the time people get to the hospital, it's often, even despite the best efforts, we don't save as many people as we could. And that's really what we're all here to do. And as Karen said in her introduction, our goal is to turn everyone into life-saving rescuers. We're trying to create an army of rescuers, which is, which is feasible. And that's what we're going to do. Um, so one of the things you know is that Dr. Bondari is one of my star expert emergency physicians. But what you might not know is that in addition to that, he's also a very, very um, experienced and expert magician. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So to get us started, Dr. Mandari is going to show us one of his magic tricks. <laughs> the idea of this is just to get our hands moving. Because what we're going to do today is going to involve, involve our hands. We want to make sure we get them loose. So I want everybody to put your hands out in front of you. This is going to prime your body and your brain to receive the life-saving information that we're about to tell you in just a few minutes. Hold your hands out right in front of you. Hold your hands out just like this. And I want you to follow me and do exactly what I do. I want you to take your hands. I want you to turn them inwards so your palms are facing outwards. You're going to take your right hand. I'm opposite of you, so remember, take your, your right hand. Cross it over on your left side just like this. Make sure you probably did this when you were a little kid. Go up just like this. Go back out. Go back out. Perfect. Just put it up a little bit higher. A little bit higher. Just a little bit higher. Just make sure your thumbs are pointing down exactly as I am. I want you to follow me and do exactly as I do. One, two, and three. <laughs> and if you're watching at home as well, hopefully the same thing happened to you. <laughs> and give yourself a round of applause. Give yourself a round. So now, that is something that may have been difficult to do with your hands. Uh, but we're going to now teach you something that you can do with your hands. Okay. 
So we're going to teach you something that you can do and that you're going to remember how to do to save a life. Um, by the way, you likely at some point will need to know how to do this. And just so you know, the most likely person that you're going to be called on to save is someone that's close to you. And often, it's actually a loved one. All right? So pay attention. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a scenario, and we're going to play the scenario out so you see in real life what something like this might actually look like and what we're asking, what we're hoping that you all learn from this event. So what we're talking about is cardiac arrest when the heart actually stops. It's no longer beating, not generating any blood flow. All right? It's a little different than a heart attack, which is more of a plumbing problem. You don't have blood flow in a heart attack to the heart muscle. In cardiac arrest, the heart's not even beating. And, it, and you really only have just a matter of minutes before irreversible damage sets in. And that's why this is so important that people recognize this and are able to do this right away. And there are two things we're going to teach you, and those are the only two things that you have to remember to do. Number one is to recognize cardiac arrest. And number two is to call 911 and begin chest compressions immediately. And we're going to show exactly how to do this. Okay? So, again, the most common scenario is someone that you know. The most common event, the location of the event, is actually at home. About three quarters of these events happen at home. And that's why you have to really be able and willing to do this. Um, what this looks like is usually a sudden collapse. A person collapses to the ground. It's not so much on TV where, where it might be someone that clutches their chest and is talking to you. It's often a sudden collapse. And sometimes, I even, you know, I, I've heard this described, it's when someone collapses in the other room. You might not even see them collapse, but you might hear them collapse. And the things to look for is someone that's unconscious, not responding to you, and we're going to show you how to test for that, and someone that's breathing abnormally. And doc, Dr. Bondari is going to show us what abnormal breathing often looks like. And, and essentially, it may look like a lot of people compare it to a fish that comes out of water. Is that, <laughs> that gasping breath that you can tell very clearly is not, an ab, is not any sort of normal breathing pattern. And that's the key more than anything else, is to be able to identify that someone is unresponsive and that they are breathing abnormally. Okay. Now we're going to, Dr. Bondari is going to do a demonstration with our friend here. All right. This is not, I heard some people before we started said, oh, they, look, they brought a dummy. This is not a dummy. <laughs> that's not a politically correct term. <laughs> this is a mannequin. We're sometimes called dummies, <laughs> okay? So what Dr. Bandari is going to do is he's going to demonstrate very quickly how to assess to see if someone's in cardiac arrest. The first thing you're going to do is assess for their responsiveness. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? And you're going to take your hand, you're going to shake them, and you're going to assess and see if you get any sort of response. And that's the first thing is that this patient is not responding. The second thing is you're going to assess for any sort of abnormal breathing pattern. So you're going to look at the patient's chest rise. You're going to just see if they are breathing normally, if they're making abnormal sounds. And it's a very quick, is this normal or this is not normal? You'll know abnormal breathing when you see it. You don't have to keep saying, is that normal, is that not normal? You know what abnormal breathing is. It either looks, okay, that's normal, or that looks like, as he said, what my fish looks like when he jumps out of the fish tank. And so those are the first two things that you're going to do is assess for their responsiveness and check for abnormal breathing. And as soon as you recognize that this person is not responsive and they are not breathing normally, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to take out your cell phone and you're going to dial 911. And now the key thing here is you want to put your phone on speakerphone. This is not something that's talked about a lot and taught in classes, but in real life scenarios, this is what actually happens. You dial 911. Put your phone on the speaker phone, and you're going to lay it next to the rescuer. So you can actually hear everything that the dispatcher is telling you while you are doing everything that you need to do. 
Now, if there is another person with you, you could ask them to call 911. But again, most likely, most commonly, it's one person with their significant other. That's the most common scenario. That's why you have to be able and willing and prepared to actually do both of these both of these steps. And the critical step is you've called 911, you've kept your phone on, you turn on speaker, and now that allows the dispatcher, the 911 dispatcher, to give you life-saving instructions and your hands are free. Yeah. And the other thing is that they're also going to be, they may be counting compressions with you as well and doing many other things at that same time. So you cannot have the phone on your ear. So there are many things that you need to have it on the speaker phone. Four. And just know, at this point of the real life interaction, that dispatcher has already notified the rescuers, the EMTs and paramedics, who are dispatched and in route. So now you have to do the key thing, which is keep the person alive until they arrive. And that key thing is what Dr. Bandari is going to show you. So what you need to do is chest compressions. And chest compressions are a very simple maneuver, but you have to know how to do them properly. In order to do chest compressions, you're going to kneel right next to the patient. You're going to take your hand out like this. Take your other hand. You can even do it right now. Go ahead. So you get the idea of, of what it looks like in real life. Put your hand out like this, and your other hand is going to go on top of it and clasp just like this. You're going to take the heel of your left hand, heel of that bottom hand, and just rest it in the center of the chest. Just find the center of the chest and rest it there. And then the key concept just to remember is you push hard and you push fast. And you don't stop. So at this point, your hands are actually their heart. That person is clinically dead. You're generating the blood flow to their heart and brain at this point. You're keeping them alive. CPR generates just enough blood flow to keep them alive and it can do it for several keep them alive for several minutes your hands are their heart at this point so any time you stop doing cpr for whatever reason there's no blood flow to their brain so a lot of people oftentimes ask how do you know if you're pushing fast enough or if you're pushing hard enough and especially when it comes to fast enough you want to go at around 100 to 120 beats per minute I know how, how do you time, remember that your next thought is, how am I supposed to know if I'm going at 100 or 120 beats per minute? So in the medical field, we think about something silly, like there's a song called Staying Alive. That song actually goes around 100 to 120 beats per minute. And it's quite appropriate in these scenarios. So in my head, oftentimes when I'm doing compressions, I go through that song. Staying alive, staying alive. Ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Excuse my voice. <laughs> okay. Staying alive, staying alive. Ah, ah, Come on, ah, you all ah, remember ah, the song alive, from the 70s. Alive. And literally, actually, singing that song in your head is such a great way to make sure that you are actually pushing at an appropriate rate. Now, the, the most common error that people make, the most common error is they're afraid to try. And usually it's because they don't want to hurt someone. In reality, the only way to really mess this up is to do nothing. You have to act. You have to try. Something is way better than nothing. So even if you're not pushing perfectly like Dr. Bandari was, you still can generate some blood flow. You want to push hard. It's, you have to push at least two inches. All right. It's pushing hard on someone's chest. The thing is, you can't do anything to them that we can't fix later on. We can fix rib fractures. We can fix damaged lungs. We do that all the time. But you have to do this. In fact, almost all of our cardiac arrest survivors say the same thing. They almost all say, when they, when they wake up, they'll say, oh, man, my chest is sore. And it is because somebody was really pushing hard and fast on their chest. You have to push hard. If you're not pushing hard enough, you're not generating blood flow. And the other thing, as he said, is you can't stop. Even brief pauses are enough to decrease the blood flow to the heart and brain. Okay? So the other question that people often have is, uh, do you have to do any sort of 
respirations or rescue breathing along with any sort of chest compressions. What we know now is that for adults who have a sudden collapse like this, so not a drowning, but a sudden collapse, that there's dissolved oxygen in the blood to keep them alive for a long time as long as you circulate that blood. That's the most critical part. The chest compressions are the foundation of all of the resuscitation. Now, if a trained rescuer, uh, experienced nurse or paramedic comes along into your home magically, they might help you and, and do some rescue breaths with the chest compressions. But again, most commonly, we're talking about a lay rescuer going it on their own. It's very complex psychomotor skill for them to try to do all of that, and it usually makes things a little too complicated. So if you're, again, a, a, a lay rescuer, and you're trying to help someone, an adult, we want you to do chest compressions hard and fast, and don't stop, okay? Now, you saw how hard he was working. I know that he had some of those that great food in the back right before we started, so he was working some of that off. <laughs> but he's going to get tired at some point. And again, sometimes you have to do this for several minutes. So he has to try to keep going. Now, if by chance there is another rescuer, like our Houston Fire Med Assistant Medical Director, Dr. Schultz, just happens to be available, he can come up and this is what this is what it ideally would look like again you don't want to stop the compressions are you getting tired yeah starting to get a little tired all right you're doing a great job i'm going to switch out ready okay. switching out in three two one switch okay that's what you want to try to shoot for if you can you don't want to walk away from the person uh, because you have to you know, get the roast beef out of the oven. You don't want to do anything like that. You want to keep going. Now, if this is one of the 25% that don't happen in the home, it happens in the public, particularly in a public location where there's a lot of people around, like maybe even an airport or a mall, something like that, then you should see, if there's other people around, if there is an AED available, okay? So an AED is an automated external defibrillator. This is designed for the public to use. Again, these are safe and highly effective. So you've seen these. You may not know you've seen them. But you've seen these in the mall, in the airport. You've seen a sign up on the wall with either a heart or a lightning bolt with AED on it, right? That's all this is. And these tend to make people a little nervous sometimes, right? This is that defibrillator. It's, it's the civilian layperson version of the you know paddles and clear and all that but it's very very simple all you have to do literally is open the box and turn it on call for help now and it's going to tell you what to do remove all clothing it's going to take you through step by step so notice dr mandari was able to do cpr over the clothes right it and i just matter. want that's an important point I, we should have pointed out he intentionally did not disrobe the victim and you know we know that sometimes you know especially if it's if it happens to be a woman if there's a modesty issue and we might be hesitant to take their 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 top off and because of that people often don't want to do cpr on a woman in fact women get less cpr than men do and it's a it's a tremendous disparity it's one of the reasons women actually have lower survival rates so what we tell, tell people is you don't have to take anyone's shirt off. In fact, you don't have to be in the perfect location. Just aim for the center of the chest and, aim, and push hard and fast. But if you do have an AED, as Dr. Schultz is going to show, you actually have to put the pads on the bare chest. So that's correct. So when you open the AED, it'll tell you what to do. It'll take you through the steps, and there'll be some kind of a packet with these two sticky pads in it. And if you look at the pads, there's pictures right on the pad. It tells you exactly where that goes. So you're going to open the, oh, take, take the, open the clothes, and I'm going to take the pad that has a picture that shows a pad right up here, and I'm going to put it right there on the patient's chest. Same thing with this one. This one shows it being underneath their left arm on the side. Peel that off, right under their left arm. I and, and actually, you don't have to sweat the exact perfect placement. Nope. It just has to be 
with the heart in the middle. It can be the front and the back, the side. It can be multiple different configurations. It just has to be with the pads on both sides of the heart. And, and you're going to see those pictures right there. And this AED, and I, I, I silenced it because we were, we're talking here, but this will be telling you the whole time exactly what to do. At this point, it's going to say, don't touch the patient. It's going to analyze the heart rhythm for you. You don't have to figure anything out. And it'll either say, start CPR, at which point, what do you do? Start CPR. Or it'll say, preparing to shock, and then it'll deliver a shock to the patient. One thing about this is if you deliver the shock to the patient, it'll say stand clear. You just want to make sure no one's touching that patient. It is an electrical shock. Uh, there's nothing to be concerned about. It's actually very safe, but just everyone wants to do, uh, wonders about that. Just make sure no one's touching the patient, and it'll deliver the shock. And then as soon as you deliver the shock, the next thing we need to do, because I don't know if this heart has been restarted or not, is start CPR again. Right. The chest compressions are the foundation of everything. You want to be doing that as much as possible. Uh, again, most of these events happen in the home. The AED is not really in most people's home. So we just show you this in the event that, you, that this does happen in a public place and you know what an AED is and it's actually safe. You don't have to have a license to use it. Um, everybody is able and, and qualified to do this. Absolutely. Now I, I hear one of our youngest uh, uh, rescuers in the background, which reminds us that cardiac arrest sometimes very sp uh, small proportion, about 1%, can happen in children. So all very, very important. So we're going to, we don't want to leave that topic out. So we're going to talk about this topic of pediatric cardiac arrest, which is, has the same foundation of chest compressions but a few minor differences that you should be aware of. So one of the most important things about pediatric cardiac arrest and, and doing chest compressions, a lot of it's the same. The first steps are the same. Recognizing a patient is unresponsive and is not breathing normally, activating 911 by calling, right? Same thing with your cell phone, put it on the ground. You're gonna work through that same process exactly the same way. The few differences, one is generally gonna be breathing. So we know that the majority of adult cardiac arrests are a cardiac problem. It's a heart problem. So doing compressions is the most important part. In pediatrics, most kids go into cardiac arrest because of an airway problem. They choke, they drown, they have a breathing problem that causes this to happen. So in kids, we really do want to encourage giving some rescue breaths, uh, if at all possible, right? Now, again, I'd rather you do CPR and just do compressions, if that's what you're comfortable with. But it as is better. To, as opposed to nothing. As opposed to nothing, yes, I'm sorry. It, but it is better if you can do rescue breaths as well. Um, and so the ratio there, you're going to do 30 compressions and then give two breaths. The key of the two breaths is I'm going to give a breath, but I'm going to give just enough breath till the chest starts to rise. I'm not blowing up a balloon, right? So you cover the nose and mouth or cover, cover the mouth and you can pinch the nose and just give a little bit of a breath, just watching that, see that chest rise up. So for a 30 and two, it'd be 30 compressions. We'll fast forward a little bit. 28, 29, 30. Breath, breath. Again, he's just watching enough air to see the chest rise and then go down. And you're right back on the chest. One thing, so that's one of the big things with pediatrics difference is breathing is more important. But again, I'd rather have see people do compressions only than do nothing at all. The other big difference we see is size, right? Children are not as large as adults. So if you have a toddler or a young child in the, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old range, one thing to note is you can do one-handed compressions. Put your hand in the exact same spot. You're going to put the one hand compressions and you're just going to do the same exact thing, but you don't need quite as much force. Now, if you have a, a, an infant under the age of one, that compression is going to be a little bit different. I don't want to put the heel of my hand in the middle of this child's chest. So typically what we do with an infant under the age of one is we take, now we always want to do compressions on a hard, flat surface. You notice we had this patient on the floor. So with an infant, that surface is coming from my hands. I put my hands, two hands behind the back. I put my thumbs in the middle of the chest. I can put this child on the floor. I can put them on the table. And I'm going to be doing compressions just squeezing that way. It's the same thing, 120, 100 to 120 beats per minute, just compressing this way. And then again, I'm gonna do 30 compressions to two breaths. 
If I have multiple people, we can change that a little bit. We can do 15 to 2. But, and in, in the real world, you would want to put this on the, uh, you wouldn't be doing the compressions out here. We and just so want we you should, to be able to see. And so we should point, that's actually a very important thing, and I'm sure someone was going to ask in, the, in our question is, is um, where does this, where do you put someone? They really need to be on a hard, flat surface. You cannot do effective chest compressions on a bed. Again, think about it. You're trying to generate blood flow, and the person's moving up and down the bed. It doesn't work. Now, how do you get them to the floor? That sometimes can be tough, especially if it's a, a, a bigger person. You have to do it. You have to pull them sometimes on a sheet. Pull them, if they're on a bed, pull them on a sheet to the floor. You want to do the best you can to brace their head. You don't want them to bang their head, but you need to get them quickly onto the floor. If they're in a chair, you know, a recliner, you need to get them onto the floor. You cannot do very effective CPR in any of those situations. And so that's, that's one of the things about infant CPR is that they are somewhat portable, right? I could do this on the kitchen counter, or the, or, but if I have to be on the floor, if we were in this room, the best play, and I had this child right here, I'll literally be right on the floor right here. Same thing, hands behind the back, doing those compressions and those breaths. Again, with an infant this small, when I put my mouth on their face, I'm going to cover their mouth and their nose, and it's a very, very, very tiny puff of air. Very tiny, because I just want to see that chest come up a little bit. That's it. I'm, again, we're not blowing up a balloon. We're just trying to get a little bit of air in there to help oxygenate the child. Good. So the key points, essentially, to remember, again, is for an adult, you want to make sure you recognize any, that they're unresponsive and that they're breathing abnormally. As soon as you do that, you call 911 on your phone, put it on speaker, put it down, and then you, and the second thing is you just start with chest compressions hard and fast. Remember the song, staying alive in your brain as you're doing it. And you do not need to do breaths for adults. For kids, that was the, the slightly separate issue with kids. They are more likely to have a respiratory issue, and that's where you want to do those extra um, respiratory breaths. And if you do those, just those two things, you can make such a dramatic difference in someone's chance of actually surviving uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest. So I told you at the beginning that roughly only about six or seven percent of people in Texas survive an out of hospital cardiac arrest to go back home all the way with their family. Um, numbers are nice, but what really matters the most is when is people and when you meet people. And so what we've shown you, this skill can triple the chance that person survives. 300% improvement survival. So to prove that to you, I'm going to invite one of our cardiac arrest survivors in Texas to come up and share with us what this has meant to him. So I'd like to invite my friend Scott Corin. Scott not only has experienced this once, he actually thought it was such an interesting experience. He decided to have two cardiac arrests outside the hospital. And obviously, Scott survived and is in wonderful shape. And he'll tell you his experience with this. Hi, thanks, Dr. Bobro and Dr. Vendari. Um, the first time I saw a cardiac arrest, I was six years old in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, with my family staying at uh, the old White Hotel, which was down the street from the Green Bar. It was a small place. <laughs> and so um, my dad worked on a man that he pulled out of the pool for many, many minutes. The old-timey ambulance that looked like a kind of station wagon showed up, and this man didn't survive. And I can still remember the silhouette of this gentleman in the back of the ambulance with a sheet over top of him. Many years later, I would volunteer in the emergency room after graduating from Rice University, and there was a kind of nurse that was kind of the pit boss there in the middle of the night, and she's still there. His name was Claire. And Claire looked at me one day, a gentleman would roll in, and she says, I want you to look at this guy's eyes. Look at this guy's eyes, these steely eyes. Scott, don't ever forget that. Two minutes later, the man was laying over with a cardiac arrest at the front of the emergency room. They rolled him into the ER. They did CPR. They brought him back to life. And I rolled him an hour later up to the CCU with the assistance of a nurse while he was talking to me. And so I knew that someone could be saved. And so a few nights ago, um, I went with a friend of mine to a, to a service. And the chief Pena uh, of the Houston Fire Department was there. And I got to talk with him briefly. And Joel Austin gave this talk about how 
we should just never give up. You know, we never give up on people. Always keep going, keep going, keep going, which is really the message of CPR, that we, we can't stop doing that. Um, many years ago, you remember uh, Jim Valvano was the North Carolina State coach that had survived cancer for a while and ultimately succumbed to cancer. Jimmy Grave, this great speech, it's, you know, don't ever give up, don't ever give up. And so I want to tell you about something as well that I, I think we should never give up on people that we love. And, and how can you do that? You can do that by learning CPR. And I want to share some names with you. Um, Eileen Meyer, now Dr. Eileen Flynn, is, was a med student, was a fourth year at University of Houston. She had just had ACLS training. Uh, Ross Mattern had been a paramedic at one time in his life. And if we were to drive straight this way or lift off of the helicopter and about 800 yards that way on the other side of I-10 is the first place I had a cardiac arrest. And Eileen and Ross beat on me for 20 minutes and kept me alive with CPR until engine 11, uh, medic 62 could show up. Um, some eight years later, uh, Natasha Afonso and Alyssa Marsnag. Natasha is a children's hospital intensive care doctor and uh, she was in a spin class with me. Alyssa Marsnag is Dr. Igor Gregoric, UT transplant surgeon's PA. She was on the bike behind me. And so three years ago, I fell off the bike in a spin club, and these two women, along with Andy Pappas of the Pappas family, uh, jumped on me and did another 20 minutes of CPR. Um, what this did is it gave the opportunity for Houston Fire Department to show up and to do the things they do, to bring me to Memorial Hermann Hospital and to do the things they do, to put me in a hypothermic coma. I sat up in bed in the middle of the coma, literally sat up in bed in the middle of the coma on a respirator. They're like, wait a minute, this guy's awake. And so what can we do to not give up on people? The first thing you can do is you can learn CPR. The second thing is to never stop doing it. Um, I oversee about 6,000 AEDs in the workplace, and regularly we see an AED that we, we can record what happened when someone used one, and we see where somebody just stopped. They just stopped too early. And so the first time over a 24-hour period, I was brought back 10 times. 10 times. At one point, the doctor looked around the table and said, this man is dead, let's give up. And a nurse named Cena John said no. A nurse named Ashley said no, we're not giving up. Alyssa Marcinac, Andy Pappas, Natasha Afonso, 20 minutes of CPR before they had an opportunity to defibrillate me. So the point is you can learn this skill, you keep doing it, you don't give up on the people you love, and you can have a good outcome. So thank you all for coming tonight, and, and thank you, Dr. Right. Byron. Thanks, Scott. So, you know, obviously our overarching goal is to dramatically increase the survival rate for cardiac arrest in Texas. To that end, we, um, in the last six months, have started what's called the Texas CARES program. CARES is an acronym for the Cardiac Arrest Registry to Enhance Survival. You know, there's an old adage, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So we've started the first, in Texas, the first statewide registry and database to track who has cardiac arrest, where, who gets CPR, when, how much, if they get to the hospital, if they survive, so that we can actually drill down and improve and strengthen our chain of survival. And so, there, so we have a program, it's called Texas Cares, you can look at it. Uh, on the Texas Cares website are places you can get free formal training. Tonight's a great start. Um, and by the way, if you ever need to do CPR, you can do it with what you've learned tonight. We like to say, I want everyone to be certified and have a, a card in their wallet, but if they don't have that card, they can still save a life. All you need are your, your two hands and the willingness to try. So you can look at the Texas Cares website to find out. There's some great free training that, that gets put on all the time uh, regularly through the Junior League. They do wonderful work. Um, but in essence, you are now all anointed as life-saving rescuers, all right, for the Houston area. Thank you so much. And again, I want to thank everyone for putting this event on. Uh, there's lots of other really important life-saving topics we would love to talk to you about in the future, but this was the first uh, what we hope will be many opportunities to, to talk with you. So thank you so much. I'm speechless. <laughs>
Uh, we normally we have a series of questions that come in. I'm going to centrifuge down a few questions uh, because this th this really w was so valuable that I uh, I, I don't really want to dilute it with with a whole bunch of questions and hopefully we can just do this again on on several levels but a couple of questions the first one i have for dr schultz or any of you can answer it but uh, when we were first taught it was that a patient had to have stopped breathing before you begin cpr so the second part of that question and i noticed that didn't exactly happen this time the second part of that question is, as you all said, normally this happens at home, you're not prepared, your spouse is in bed, all of a sudden you hear the choking, strange uh, breathing. So the two-part question is, we're all getting rid of our landlines, which used to be our savior because you could track our address. Thank you for having said, get it on speaker. The second part is, as dumb as it sounds, when you're in that kind of state, how much time do you have to run? Do you run to your front door and unlock it? Does HFD come and break it down? I, I, I'm not kidding. I mean, these are all actually real life important these issues. These are real life issues. It's, it's the, the rubrics and, and just the logistics of getting uh, in that golden three and a half, four minutes where, where the patient is anoxic and there's, there's no oxygen going to the brain. So if you could clear that up and then we'll go on. Sure, so, so briefly, first of all was the question on a landline. And landlines were great in the sense that when you pick up the phone and call 911, they could pretty much tell you exactly where you are. In, in the days of cell phones, that's not so much the case. When you actually call 911, it's gonna be really frustrating. If, if anyone has ever, called 911, you know the first like six things they ask you have nothing to do with what's going on. Right, they're gonna say police, fire, EMS. Okay, where are you? What's your callback number? What's your name? They're gonna ask you a whole bunch of, what's the cross street? Whole bunch of information, all right? Because if you get disconnected, they wanna be able to get someone to you, even though you, the phone got disconnected. So while the landline's going away, you lost that kind of geolocating tech process the flip side is the cell phone, right? I don't know where there's a landline. I'm sure there's one somewhere here, but, but I know I have this in my pocket, right? Or next to the bed or wherever it is. So that piece is important. As far as the front door, um, that's actually a great question. We see that a lot. And in reality, in the if you think about the time it's gonna take me to get from here, out of bed, downstairs, unlock the front door, come running back up, pull the person off the bed and then start compressions, that's a long time. Right, if we're here and that's the front door, I might run over, unlock it, and come back. But as a general rule, start compressions, right? Start CPR. Tell the 911 dispatcher, remember, we have you on speakerphone. Tell the 911 dispatcher, hey, the front door is locked, but the back door is open, right? They can get that to the fire department, fire department can come around the back, or the garage door is open. Or the doors are all locked, do you want me to leave and go, go open the doors? They're gonna tell you no, and you'll be getting a new door. But at the end of the day, you have the potential to save that person's life. It's worth a new door. Yeah. So. So Leo, how about you answer the question about do you have to stop breathing completely to start CPR? I mean, it's not, it's, at the end of the day, what you really care about is that someone is breathing abnormally. Someone's breathing abnormally or they're not breathing at all. Like, you just start compressions. And if you're not sure, you start compressions. So at the end of the day, it's a matter of them just not breathing normally or not breathing at all. Listen, if you start compressions and they're not actually in cardiac arrest, say they are had one too many, they're intoxicated, people will push your hand away and they'll say, hey, well, get off me, what are you doing? They won't let you do CPR. If they let you do CPR, they need the CPR, all right? So again, the, the thing is, if, you're un, if you suspect they're in cardiac arrest, you start, it'll quickly become apparent whether they need it or not. And you're not, we know that you're not gonna harm them. You don't cause any long lasting harm. Okay, a couple of other questions. If someone's been unconscious or you're a bystander, you come, you're watching several people working on them, 
they're still unconscious, five minutes have passed, people are giving out, do you still try? Or do you say, five minutes has passed, what kind of brain activity? Well, we might ask Scott Corrin to answer that yes, one. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I believe he answered that question. <laughs> the first time in Memorial Park before the fire department arrived. Our fire department is very overworked in Houston. And so I've seen many examples of AEDs where I've read and scored AEDs that people were shocked six, eight, ten times and still came back and went on to be normal. Um, and so another ten resuscitations at the hospital. And so don't ever stop until they arrive. Don't ever stop the compressions. Don't ever take the AED off. What we see often is when you put an AED on, in the first pass, and it's, it listens, and it's looking at the heart, telling you, and it's like, shock not advised, shock not advised, resume CPR, and you keep doing the CPR. Because what happens is in the course of your doing those compressions effectively, as Dr. Schultz and Dr. Babro and Dr. Bindari demonstrated, one of the <laughs> benefits of cardiac arrest is you can't learn people's new names. So, <laughs> so is that in doing the compressions, you can actually put the heart in a rhythm that it's ready to receive a shock. And so as cardiac arrest precipitates into a worse situation, then you have a ventricular fibrillation. The heart is just fibrillating, and it needs a shock. Yeah. So keep going, keep going, don't stop and, going. And back to that question of when do you stop, I don't know what your record is, Dr. Schultz or Dr. Bondari. My record is I have personally had patients who got 48 minutes of bystander CPR. 48 minutes. And they walked out of the hospital, and I've had lunch with them. So it is possible. Um, and and I so do, I do want to add one thing to that, because my personal record was uh, 22 minutes by myself. And I turned around once the fire department had gotten there. This was not in Houston. It was a different city. And there was a crowd like this watching me, right? If you're all here, I don't care if I'm in scrubs. I don't care if I'm in a fire department uniform. If you're here and one person's here by themselves, I can tell you right now, we've done a lot of this. That's tiring. The little bit we did here is tiring. So if you can come in and help out and switch out, you're trained. You don't, it doesn't matter that we're physicians and you're not. You can do CPR just as well as any of us. So please, 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 you know, if you're in a public place, that's one other piece. And that's going to be what prevents you from having to stop. Because you will get tired. You will get exhausted. So to prevent you, the patient from not having compressions, everybody pitches in. We could go for an hour with the people in the room easily. OK, I have one more question, and then I know we probably need to close. I know this is about CPR, cardiac arrest, the, st the stopping of a heart, but as a grandmother, <laughs> I would be remiss in not asking, a, particularly with children or oneself if they live alone, Heimlich maneuver, choking, can you give us, I, I, I know it would require a, a, a better training, but what can we learn about helping someone in a restaurant or our grandchild uh, or ourselves when it comes to choking sure. on an object, on an object. So before, we, before this is demonstrated, an important thing is if someone is, you think choking, if they're coughing effectively and they're <laughs> really able to take a breath in and cough it, you want to let them do that because likely, most likely, they're going to cough whatever they've, they've eaten up, all right? Demonstrate a little bit on, on adult victim. Right. But if they, if they can't cough or they can't speak or they really are looking like they're in, getting worse or extremist, then this is the technique. Yeah. Since you want to take your hand and place it right underneath the rib bone, so the bottom of your pinky is kind of around where the, the belly button is. So the, the top of your hand where your thumb is is kind of right underneath that, that rib bone. The other hand goes on top of it, and you want to push inwards and upwards in very forceful contractions. You you're, you're essentially creating a cough, a strong cough for the person. And then, but for infants and, and little children, it might look a little bit uh, different. It'll look like this. So the, so the biggest thing with an infant is obviously this is not going to be particularly effective. So what you're going to do is you're actually going to lay, lay the child on your arm this way, okay? You're, support, you're supporting their head. 
and I'm just going to take the heel of my hand and I'm just popping them in the back, right? We're again creating that cough just on the back repeatedly, okay? If you, if you get, arm starts getting tired, you can switch arms. The other option is you can kneel down and put, their, put them on your knee here so that you're, hold, you're can, can, uh, holding that weight, but you're just going to keep going until hopefully that comes out or you get help coming to you. Okay, so that's going to be how, it, how you're going to take care of an infant with that. If you have a small child who's not an infant and you can't hold up, you can do it the exact same way Dr. Bhandari de demonstrated. You just may need to get down on, on your knees behind the child. So and gravity plays a role. I'm assuming Gravity you're... absolutely plays a role, especially with the infant. Notice, you know, we want to have the head down so that as we go, gravity's helping pull that up out of the airway. And a lot of people often ask, well, what happens with, let's say, from the choking, you keep doing it, it doesn't dislodge, and then he collapses and he, and he goes on the ground. In that scenario, he, you, he's on the ground, you lie him on the ground, and you're going to do chest compressions. Chest compressions are essentially going to help also dislodge uh, that object uh, from his mouth at the same time and also be providing compression at the same time to allow the heart to start to mm -hmm. start. Mm -hmm. So and the last thing is a lot of people will try to squeeze it with their finger and try to get it out. If you can see it very clearly and it's very easy, that's fine, remove it, but otherwise don't go blindly in because you can very easily push something was normally as, as it was coming out. And lastly, if you are all by yourself. And choking? Yes. So the, uh, the, the best thing you can do, uh, first of all, the, one of the best things you can do is try and activate 911 and get help coming to you, right? So get your cell phone out. If you can get any words out, you know, I'm dial 911 or if you're, while you're conscious, text, text a friend and say, send help, whatever it may be. But in terms of choking, is the best you can do is essentially take the back of a chair, put it in the same spot we were just discussing, and just kind of throw your weight down onto it and try and co create that cough. So it's that same, same motion that Dr. Madari was demonstrating with his hand. You're just taking the, edge of a, the back edge of a chair or something like that to, to push on that. Okay, all of you, uh, let me just, it, it, did you have a final word, Dr. Well, Pepper? I just want to say you are all officially certified to do this in an emergency, okay? We do, we do want you to and, and hope that you'll go on and get more training and practice. Uh, you can look at the Texas CARES website where you can get free training and certification through the Junior League. Um, but again, you can save a life now. We are gonna, we're gonna be available, and we are gonna have the mannequins here. We would love for you to, if you're interested, to come and practice, and you can get coaching by some of the world's foremost CPR experts. And if you, if you wanna get certified and trained, there's a woman here that I invited, a good friend of mine, Janet McClain, has taught people for 30 years. She was the lead instructor at the Red Cross, and is really adept at teaching people, wherever you are, your business, your home, uh, to do CPR. And to those of you out in the, uh, who, in the viewing audience who don't have the pleasure of being live with us, uh, you can always go to the Red Cross or to the American Heart Association as well. Yep. Okay, Doctors Babro, Bandari, and Schultz. Sounds like a great law firm. Thank you for this precious, precious gift of knowledge that one, may one day give someone else the gift of life. And a heartfelt thanks to Mr. Scott Corin for sharing your remarkable story of surviving and thriving because there were people standing by who were prepared to act. 
And of course, to ABC 13 for giving us this most incredible platform to inspire our community to lead healthier lives through these events. And I'd also like to extend our gratitude to UT Physicians, our partners in health from McGovern Medical School, who teach, train, treat, and provide the highest quality care for ourselves and our families. Tonight is the final UT Health House Call for 2019, and we could not have possibly ended this on a higher note. It is such an honor to partner with Mercedes-Benz, an organization that really walks the walk and talks the talk uh, when it comes to health and safety, whether it is the, the safety engineering in your cars or whether it's the safety and health information that you impart to your community as a member of the community. Thank you to Mr. Jinx and Mercedes-Benz for making this unique experience possible and congratulations to Bridget and Jared for their scholarships, again, because of Mercedes-Benz. To view this evening's program, all of you who may want to get a refresher course, please visit abc13.com slash promotions. Promotions is an important word. And if you're looking for a holiday gift idea this year, consider a CPR course. <laughs> it's truly the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays and good night. <laughs>